Rainbow Reflections, Book 1, A Kind of Magic, Chapter 23, Bijou. On January 22nd, all art classes were canceled for the Day of the Moon. Though many of the students had celebrated the holiday early with their families during winter break, they still got the day off to celebrate on the holiday itself. Sorella left her room that morning just as a snowball hit her window. She jumped in fright, but quickly recomposed herself and went to glare out the window at whoever had thrown the snowball. It was Zin or Ren, of course. Only they would be brave enough to throw a snowball at the Saihan Tower, and at her window specifically. She scowled at them, then realized that students were flinging snowballs all over the place. Maybe I'll just stay inside, she uttered. She went down the stairs to the family room and was surprised to see decorations all over. There were dazzling lights strung around the room of gold and blue. A few clippings of pine and holly branches were strewn about the tables, adding green and red colors to the mix. Several tall candles stood on the largest round table, each of them sparkling whether they were white, black, or blue. They released smells of cinnamon and spruce. Snowflakes floated in the air, probably a result of Hyaktu's magic. Okay, she murmured as she poked a chilly snowflake and sent it flying across the room. Must be for the holiday. Hyaktu was sitting at one of the small tables, dressed in a blue sweater and fuzzy hat. He glanced up at her and smiled. It's indeed for the holiday, he said. Our family has yet to celebrate the holiday itself, since we didn't celebrate the moon festival over winter break. Why is the holiday even during school time? Sorella asked. While each of the festivals take place in the beginning of the season, each of the holidays are halfway through their respective seasons, Hyaktu explained. Winter begins in December and lasts until the end of February. Its holiday would therefore be in January. Why not have it sooner? Sorella grumbled. Why not have it on the first of the month when we were on break? The seasonal holidays and the minor holidays switch between 11 and 22. Double numbers are important in Galia. Anyhow, it's not like I can change the country's holidays. Sorella rolled her eyes, then frowned. Wait, minor holidays? They were more than the seasonal holidays? Oh, yes, Hyakti said with a nod. The major holidays are the Day of the Moon, the Day of Nature, the Day of the Sun, and the Day of Spirits. Each of those are seasonal holidays. The other holidays are scattered throughout the rest of the months. These holidays would be those celebrating the elements, plants, crystals, and planets. Not too many people celebrate them these days, but they're still noted on calendars. Sorella frowned. So there's, like, an Earth Day? Yep, that's on March 22nd, Hyaktu said promptly. So only Earth magicians would celebrate that day. Right? No, anyone is free to celebrate it. I personally celebrate each holiday as it comes, even if it's with a small meditation focused on thanking nature and the spirits for the element or season. But for the most part, yes. Mostly Earth magicians would celebrate that day and not be keen on celebrating Air Day or Water Day, for example. Sorella twirled her hair around her finger thoughtfully. I kind of understand why we have holidays for the elements, and the sun and the moon, but why the planets, and plants and crystals? Plants and crystals are the source of natural magic, and plants especially make up a large part of our magic. They make the wands we use, they're in the potions we make, they're a part of enchantment magic, and they help heal. And of course, we eat plants and rely on them for clothing. Plants are very important to Seder. Crystals are also a source of magic and aid us in enchantments and healing. As for the planets, it's more of an astrology-based holiday. Our sun and moon signs determine which elemental magic we are born with, after all. A good handful of people celebrate the holiday by appreciating the planets, even if it's mostly just the sun and moon, which determine our magic. 
do the other planets play a role in determining our magic? Yakti chuckled. I can see you've already forgotten Lost Term's lectures. Sarala scowled. Yes, the other planets play a small role in determining a person's magic. Mostly if the person is born at dawn or dusk, when the sun or moon are both out. But I won't bore you with all the details. Why don't you run along outside and join Ren and Zin in a nice snowball fight? Sarala snorted. No thanks, she said plainly. Or you can stay in and hide with me, Hyakti said with a shrug. Care to join me for a game of checkers? She really didn't want to, feeling suddenly awkward as she stood there. But she already said she didn't want to go outside, and how would it look if she denied Hyakti's invitation? Sitting down across from him, she realized the board was already set. Had he been expecting her to play? I was waiting for Zin to come back in. He explained as she eyed the game. We always play games on this day. Well, on any holiday, actually. Do you do anything else for the holidays? Hyakti nodded. Just before or after lunch, we go on a walk in nature. We show our appreciation of the seasons and the natural forces at work in our world, and we show our gratitude to the spirits. We then hold a meditation in a spiritual region. When we return to the tower, we often play games and music together, showing our appreciation of one another. We also share gifts, which is an annual tradition most families take part in. On this particular holiday, we do one more meditation at nightfall, as close to the moon as we can get. Just then, the door to the tower opened, and the twins stepped in. They chuckled as they threw snowballs at Hyaktu and Sarala. What was that for? Sorala snarled, barely able to block the snowball before it hit her face. Oh, lighten up, Ren laughed. You didn't come out to join us, so we thought we'd join you. Is it game time? Zin asked excitedly. Sorry, but I'm already playing with Sorala, Hyaktu said, and he quickly moved his game piece forward with one hand, using his other hand to make the water from the snowballs turn into more floating snowflakes. But you two were too busy playing outside all morning. Why don't you get changed into warmer clothes? We'll go on our morning walk soon, Hyaktu said. Okay, the twins said in very different voices, and they bounded away up the stairs. Sorella and Hyaktu managed to play several quiet games of checkers before the sisters returned, Sorella winning each match. Zin was dressed in the white robe covered in rainbow stars that she had stolen from the theater. She wore a gray and white stripy shirt and baggy blue pants underneath. Zin, did you steal my pants again? Hyaktu asked in pretend exasperation. No, maybe. Don't worry about it, Zin said, trying not to laugh as she waved her hand carelessly. But Sorella wasn't focused on Zin. Her eyes were glued on Ren, who looked similar to how she did for the dance. She was dressed in a brilliant blue robe with moon patterns all over it. Beneath the robe, she wasn't wearing her usual sports shirt or sweatpants, but a collared shirt and dress pants. She also wore a crystal moon necklace, which reflected the blue and gold lights of the room. Her purple hair was pulled back in a tail, leaving a fringe of hair nearly falling over her left eye. Throughout the entire semester, Ren had never pulled her hair back. She typically had a sloppy look about her, which matched her energetic personality. But now, she was an impressive sight to behold. Sorala felt her mouth suddenly go dry, and she shifted uneasily in her chair. Um, if we're supposed to dress all fancy, she said to Hyaktu, I don't have anything. Sure you do, Hyaktu said. Zin will just get that theater costume you wore at the dance. Sorala really did not want to wear those clothes again, not after what had happened, or didn't happen, at the dance. But before she could protest, Zin hurried away to do as her father asked. Sorala felt an uncomfortable knot twisting in her stomach. Zin soon returned with the purple dress Sorala had worn to the dance. She took it from Zin, not bothering to thank her, then went up to the bathroom to get changed. When she entered the family room again moments later, Hyaktu was gone. Where'd your dad go? Sorala asked blankly. He went to get a nicer robe too, Ren said. 
He felt underdressed next to us three. A few minutes later, Hyaktu came down the stairs, dressed in a royal blue robe with a large moon on the back, much like the robe Ren had worn to the dance. He also wore a crescent moon necklace similar to Ren's. He would have looked well-dressed if it wasn't for the fuzzy hat he still had covering his head. Ready to go? Hyaktu asked. Yep. Okay, let's meet up with Kershid, Aster, and Fern. Sorala stared at Hyaktu in dismay. The other teachers were joining them too? Why? Now, considering what happened for the Day of Spirits, Hyaktu said, looking at Ren, we will be going on a walk in the greenhouse instead of the forest. Not to mention, we can't have all of the teachers leave the school when students are here. Are we not having breakfast? Sorala asked. Hyaktu considered her for a moment. We already ate breakfast, and it's put away by now. Sorella sighed. Sometimes, she really hated sleeping in. The four left the tower and crossed the freezing courtyard, many students yowling and laughing as they held snowball fights. They stumbled through the garden outside the greenhouse, then entered to see that the other three teachers were already there. The teachers were dressed in clothing made from the thick substance found on fuzzy trees, which was a common material in clothing, especially in colder regions. It wasn't as chilly in the greenhouse as it was outside, but it was still cooler than what Sorala was used to. They walked along the bottom floor as best as they could, pushing through the thick undergrowth of purple leaves and spotted flowers. The plants were making lots of shrieking and sucking noises, seeming louder than usual. Sorala didn't speak much to her friends as they went. Zin was chatting with Ren, who was taking pictures of the plants with the family mirror. Sorella soon dropped back, feeling that it was a bit pointless to be walking with them if she wasn't saying anything. The teachers were just behind the students. Sorala tried to fall and step beside Hyaktu, wondering if she could strike up a conversation with him. But he was talking to Kershid and Fern. The only one who seemed left out was Aster. Sorala found herself next to the librarian, feeling awkward. She knew he was friendly and upbeat from the one class she took with him, but she couldn't say she knew him more than her fellow first years. After all, fashion was more of a laid-back club, where the students chatted with each other while designing clothing, and Aster didn't take too active a role in teaching them. She therefore tried to fall behind a bit more by staring at a spinning bush. To her dismay, Aster joined her. It's a very interesting plant, isn't it? He commented. Sorala shrugged. I Yes, she said. I've seen plenty of these before. Aster nodded. Yes, you lived in the wild, didn't you? Those who come from cities are always a bit surprised to see plants like this. Cities are certainly not the most magical places. But magic isn't everything, Sarala said bluntly. So cities have to be magical places, don't they? Aster shrugged, combing his hand through his blonde hair. I suppose that's true, in a way. But in terms of environments, there's not much magic to cities, now is there? You can feel it. Sorella frowned, but didn't know what to say. She therefore hurried to catch up to the other teachers, Wondering if Hyaktu, or even Kershid, were free to talk instead. Zin and Ren, who were leading the group, came to a stop beside what looked to be an ancient tree covered in squishy moss. They had now climbed to the second floor, where the tree's uppermost branches reached. Sorella waited in the back, wondering why they had paused. It was soon apparent as Hyaktu approached the tree with his arms spread in front of him. Nature, we thank you for the season of winter. We thank you for allowing us to get through the past year, facing challenges that made us grow. We thank you for the balance and peace you bring, and appreciate the storms and turmoil you throw at us that challenge us to grow. Spirits, we thank you for the guidance and lessons you teach us. We thank you for showing us how to merge with our own inner spirits. We thank you for the moments of fun and of hardships, knowing both are necessary. 
Sorella shifted uneasily. She knew Hyaktu had mentioned something about spirits and praising nature, but this seemed a bit ridiculous. Who was he even speaking to? Zin and Ren stepped closer to the tree, their arms out on either side of them too. They started speaking, saying similar things of following nature and maintaining balance. Sorella tuned them out. Not liking it? Aster asked her quietly. Sorella stiffened. It's quite fine if you don't. He continued, his gaze amused. I don't care for it either. She frowned, glancing up at him. I've told Hyaktu many times now that praising the spirits does no good. Nobody listens, or hardly anybody does. And they certainly don't care. Spirits are selfish beings. They do not worry about others, particularly those in the physical realm. They do not care if they've impacted someone's life in a good way or not. The majority of spirits are just there, existing, not caring what's going on beyond their noses. Sorella did not know how to reply. She still refused to believe in spirits until she saw one. But she had mostly heard good things about spirits from the Saihan family. It seemed spirits only acted badly if nature was destroyed, or the spirits were disrespected. Aster was making it sound like all spirits were bad, no matter what. If they existed, that was. So you still believe that spirits exist, despite not liking them? Sorella asked in a whisper, as Ren continued praising the spirits. Aster nodded. Oh yes, I've seen plenty of spirits, and I've lived in the spirits around myself. Sorala stared at him. It's not a lie, he said, inspecting one of his painted nails. I used to be connected very much to the spirits, but now... He shrugged. My connection to the spirit realm has long since vanished. Sorella wondered why that was. Didn't spiritual people, who claim to make a connection to not only the spirit realm, but also spirit magic, want to keep that connection? Who would suddenly choose to become unspiritual if being spiritual was such a highly sought-after state of mind, if it was the key to a great and powerful life? The praising was soon over, with Kershid and Fern adding a few words themselves. Hyaktu then led the group onwards, walking with his hands on his children's shoulders. Sorala and Astra followed at the back of the group, several paces away. It's a bit difficult being here sometimes, Astor told her. You know, at the school, with the Saihan family, all the spiritual stuff. There's nothing wrong if you don't fit in with the rest of that lot. He nodded at the group in front of them. There's nothing wrong with being an outsider. An outsider? Sorala wondered. Is that what I am? Is it so obvious that I don't belong here? Of course, I don't have a problem with Hyaktu or his family, or any of the other teachers, Aster persisted. I just rather... Not get involved in all the spirit stuff. Then why are you here? Sorala grumbled. Because I want to spend time with my friends. Even though you're such an outsider to them? Sorala asked pointedly. Aster shrugged. I could have a conversation with them easily if I chose to. But I'm talking with you, now aren't I? Anyway, I always promise to do at least one of these holiday traditions with Yaktu. I know how much it means to him. Sorella frowned, but made no response. Is that what I'm doing? Just going along with it to make them happy? Yaktu brought them to a halt on the third floor, beside another ancient tree that smelled like sweet berries. The tree had long drapes of blue moss-looking leaves 
appearing like a tall stick with blankets covering it. Hyaktu sat down on the walkway as close to the tree as he could get. He then closed his eyes, sitting upright. Zin and Ren followed his lead, Kershid and Fern soon joining. We don't have to do the meditation, Aster told her softly, and he nodded to the stairs behind them. Let's wait downstairs. The two therefore proceeded back down the spiraling wooden steps until they reached the ground floor. Sorella could not see the tree that the group was meditating around, as the undergrowth was so thick and the plants constantly moved. Though she still wasn't sure what to make of Aster, she was grateful he allowed her to get away from the weird meditation. Aster continued to make small chat, talking about school and classes and how he was already planning his finals. Sorala ignored him, only making small noises every now and then to pretend she was listening. She wasn't sure how long the two stood there, but eventually, Hyaktu and the others returned. She sighed in relief, glad that they could get on with the day and hopefully put all these spirit rituals behind them. Who's ready for some games? Zen yowled, bounding forward. And music, Ren said excitedly. I gotta love the family traditions, Aster said, his eyes sparking in amusement. Sorala glanced up at him, frowning. Family traditions. Is that what all of this is? Is that why Ren and Zin are so excited? Did my family have traditions? Would I be so excited for them too? What if... What if my family was spiritual? That'd be so weird. What if I was some sort of version of Ren? Ugh, that'd be the weirdest thing. I can't imagine ever being like her. Sorella followed the others back into the courtyard. It had started to snow again, and the students throwing snowballs had mostly vanished indoors to escape the creeping cold. I wonder... Was my family ever a family? Did I have a family before I became an orphan? What would it have been like? The image of a person in red appeared in her mind's eye. Sorala shut her eyes tightly. No, you're not family. You never were, not after what you did. She thought dismissively. Leave me alone. Sorella joined the Saihan family for games until lunch. After eating, Hyaktu announced they'd be doing the traditional gift exchange. Sorella instantly retreated to her room without a word. She didn't know if she was supposed to get anything for the family, not that she had anything to give, and she didn't want to receive anything from them. She therefore practiced martial arts alone, trying to do her jump kicks properly. It was such a struggle to propel herself up, and she didn't want to land too hard and jolt her knees. She gave up after several attempts, due to the wood floor being a bad surface to jump upon. She practiced the three techniques she'd learned in the previous class, but soon grew bored. She wanted to do something else. She wanted to play with weapons. But I have weapons, she remembered. She went over to the large desk on one side of her room and pulled open a drawer. Two knives sat within, thick and curved. The dual butterfly knives had been her only possessions when she arrived at the school. She had kept the knives in her robe at the start of classes, but didn't want to be found with them. She therefore stashed them away at the beginning of the fall semester. And I've forgotten about them since, she thought dismally. I'm so sorry. I'll make it up to you. She pulled out the knives and began practicing with them. She had played with knives a lot when she lived in the wild, as it was something to do to pass the time when she wasn't traveling or looking for food. By the time she had reached the school, she had admittedly grown a little wary with the weapons, so doing kung fu was new and more interesting. At first, Sorella would just play games with the knives and didn't know how to use them. But she taught herself different techniques, practicing on the plants around her. Now that she knew Kung Fu, she could apply different stances to these techniques and refine her movements. She was practicing with the knives for so long that she was only made aware of the time when the bell rang for dinner. I'll go in a bit, she thought, 
as she wanted to finish the technique she was putting together. But she soon forgot that the bell had even run, and continued working on her form, wishing she had a mirror to check that her stances were low enough and her knee wasn't poking too far over her toes. A knock sounded loudly on her door, and she whirled around, clutching her weapons more tightly. Sorella, you in there? Ren's voice called. Yeah, Sorella replied. You coming for dinner? In a moment. What are you up to? Martial arts? Yeah. Oh, are you doing your jump kicks? Can I see? Before Sorala could protest, Ren opened the door and poked her head in. She froze when she saw the knives in Sorala's hands, which Sorala failed to hide behind her back quickly enough. The two girls stared at one another, Sorala uncertain, and Ren's face unreadable. What are you doing with those knives? Ren finally asked in a low voice, stepping in and closing the door behind her. Did you take them from the Kung Fu studio? Sorala shook her head. You have butterfly knives here? She queried. Well, I saw Dad with them before, Ren said. But what are you doing with them? Where did he get them? I've had them for a while, Sorala said plainly. Wait, you had them when he came to the school? Ren asked in surprise. But we didn't see them on you. Dad would have confiscated them right away. They were in my robe, Sorala said in exasperation. Ren frowned. Well, you're not allowed to have weapons of your own. All weapons have to be in the Kung Fu studio, and weapon training has to be under Dad's supervision. Or Kershid's, I guess. But either way, you can't have those. Oh, like you didn't break the rules with getting Zin enrolled and leaving the school to help a non-existent animal. Sorala scoffed. They're my knives, and I'm keeping them. I understand they're one of your few possessions. They're my only possessions. But it's a really important rule that everyone has to follow, Ren said, a bit apologetically. Weapons can be dangerous. It's not like I'd use them on anyone. Besides, we have wands. Aren't those weapons too? You don't even have to use them for magic. You can just stab someone with them. Same with a pencil. Anything can be a weapon. Ren snorted. Sarala, you know what I mean. Bladed weapons aren't allowed, unless they were fake, perhaps. But those are clearly not fake. I'm not giving them up, Sarala hissed. They mean too much to me, even though they shouldn't. Should they? Ugh, I was better off just leaving them in the drawer and forgetting all about them. Ren bit her bottom lip, looking apprehensive. Well, even if I feel uncertain about them. Sorala shook her thoughts away and declared, I made them myself. I'm not losing them. You made them? Ren asked in surprise. Sorala nodded once. You're a blacksmith? I suppose, she grumbled. But I thought you lived in the wild. I did. Then how did you- You said it was time for dinner, right? We'd better hurry if we're going to eat then, Sorala said abruptly. She walked over to her desk, opened one of the drawers, and placed her knives in the very back. Taking a notebook sitting on top of the desk, she threw it in front of the knives so they'd at least be somewhat concealed. Sorala then pushed past Ren, opened the door, and led the way down the stairs. Ren trailed after her a bit hesitantly, once closing the door, much to Sorala's relief. Why don't you ever want to talk about your past? Ren asked. Why would I? Sorala grunted. You know, there's no shame in being an orphan. I know it's terrible, as you don't know your real family. Or maybe you do, if you grew up with them, and then that'd be even worse to end up as an orphan, but... Sorala whipped around angrily. Just because you're apparently an orphan doesn't mean you get to speak for other orphans, or other children who have had rough lives, she sneered. You've had a family your whole life, blood kin or not. You've lived in a mighty school, always protected and looked after. You don't have to fight to survive or attempt to steal food without being caught. 
You didn't have to face the wrath of nature or the dangerous wildlife. You don't know what it's like out there. She turned and stomped down the stairs, the image of the red-clad woman appearing in her mind's eye again, her jaw clenched. I'm better off alone. I've always been better off alone. Sorella and Ren did not speak much that night, despite Ren joining Sorella for dinner and apologizing several times. Sorella did her best to ignore the other girl, even when Ren brought her the last sweet chocolate roll for dessert. But by the time they returned to the tower and Ren gave Sorella a book about weapons as a gift for the Day of the Moon, Sorella was more willing to forgive her words. She therefore shrugged it off, thanked Ren, and hoped to sleep off their small fight. The next day, Sorella woke up in a better mood. She was a bit hesitant to see Ren at first, but when Ren was overjoyed to see her, she realized that she had nothing to worry about. Feeling a little guilty for how she'd snapped at Ren, Sorella agreed to go to the art club meeting that morning. But it seemed her bad mood had transferred to Ren when Ren learned Zin didn't want to go too. As soon as the door to the art studio closed behind the two girls, Ren started whispering to Sorella. Why do you think Zin didn't want to come today? How should I know? Sorella replied gruffly, not in the mood to talk. Did she mention anything to you? Sorella grabbed a piece of paper from a cabinet on the far side of the room. She returned to her seat, nodded to Mint as she entered, then faced Ren. No, she didn't say anything. The door opened again as Raimugi and Marneo entered. Sorella smirked in satisfaction as she saw Frost was not with them. Ren lowered her voice further. You know how Zin's next therapy appointment is coming up? Yeah, it's next Thursday, isn't it? Well, she was talking to me a bit last night, before we had our... Well, when we were doing the family gift exchange, and she... Ren took a deep breath, then whispered so faintly, Sorella had to strain to hear her. She wants to go by he, him pronouns and identify as a boy. Okay, Sorella said. So why are you referring to him as a girl still? She's, he's pushing away from me, Ren hissed. Can't you see that? He no longer wants to be twins. Sorella stared at the purple-haired girl for a long moment, glad that she wasn't the only one to overreact. Ren, you're an idiot. She finally grunted. You and Zen will always be twins. But we do everything together, and now she, he, no longer wants to. Ren cried softly, taking off her glasses to rub out her watery eyes. I feel like this whole gender crisis is just making him push away from me even more. Twins aren't supposed to be the same person, Sorella pointed out propping her elbow on her desk as the door opened to admit C3. Just because Zin no longer wants to be a girl, doesn't mean he no longer wants to be your twin. You two share a special connection, unlike any I've ever seen. But even regardless of the gender thing, Zin doesn't want to spend time with me. Or maybe it's because of it. Just because he literally didn't come to one art club meeting? Sorella scoffed. Ren, you're being ridiculous. Ren glared at her for a long moment, then sighed. Yeah, but I still feel like there's something Zin isn't telling me. Zin just needs time to figure things out for himself, Sorella said with a shrug. The two fell quiet for a while, both of them staring down at their blank pieces of paper. Raimugi and Reneo were talking in low voices on the other side of the room, while Mint hummed softly to herself as she collared at the desk across from them. Nobody seemed to have heard their quiet conversation. What are you going to draw today? Sorella asked Ren, changing the topic so Ren would stop worrying. Ren glanced down at her paper, as if noticing it for the first time. Oh, um, I don't know. How about a cat? Ren glanced over her shoulder at C3, who sat at the desk behind her. He was focused entirely on sketching a castle lightly with his pencil. Sorella frowned, not even noticing he had entered the room. A cat? 
Ren said thoughtfully. Oh, did you say cats? Mint asked eagerly, glancing up. Cats are so cool. Cats are scary. Sorala muttered, remembering the time a large tiger had been stalking her in the jungle. She shivered and added, I hate cats. Mint pulled out her mirror from her backpack, nearly dropping it as she did so, and unlocked it. She tapped them on its surface, then turned the mirror for Sorala and Ren to see. There was a photo of a small cat with spots. Cats are really cute, Mint said, beaming at Sorala. Sorala squinted closer. That's tiny. It's a farm cat, Mint said promptly. Little cats that hang around farms. They don't kill the farmers, Sorala queried. Mint looked horrified and nearly dropped her mirror again. Kill them? No! Why would you think that? Because big cats kill people all the time, C3 said, still concentrated on his sketch. Sorala nodded. That's too true, she growled in a low voice. He looked up at her, seeming surprised that she agreed with him. His lips twitched slightly, but then he returned to his drawing without a word. I guess I'll draw a farm cat then, Ren declared, and she leaned forward to draw. I saw a farm cat a few months ago, and it was so cute. Sorala shifted uneasily. It's not that cute, she said. I doubt you find anything cute, C3 commented. Sorella turned in her chair to glare at him. Oh, and you do? What do you find cute? C3 froze, his pencil hovering over the paper in front of him. That's what I thought, Sorella replied, smirking lightly. But there are so many cute things in the world, Mint said, her voice shrill as she glanced from Sorella to C3 and back again. Have you ever seen a screaming bush? It's so tiny and its screams are like melodies. I wish they'd call it the singing bush instead. C3 snorted derisively. Only a fool would enjoy the wails of a plant, he said. Stop being a jerk, Sorala growled, clenching her jaw as Mint's eyes grew watery. C3 huffed. I'm just pointing out a fact. It's called a screaming bush for a reason. It does not sound like it's singing. Maybe not to you, but to Mint it does, Ren said, offering Mint a smile. She sees things from a unique perspective. And not a box, Sorella said bluntly. I wouldn't talk if I were you, C3 sneered. Sorella's jaw clenched harder. Why don't we just get back to drawing? Mint asked, her voice high and tense. Please? That sounds great, Ren agreed, turning to her art again. Sorella glared at C3, who returned her gaze steadily. But then he went back to his castle sketch, pushing his pencil down so strongly that the tip began to wobble as he darkened the lines. Sorella turned around and stared at her own blank paper. Am I as narrow-minded as C3? She wondered, sighing heavily. She glanced over at Ren, who was now adding wings to her cat. I guess I can be. I sure don't care about all that spirit stuff. Not at all. Sorella began sketching absentmindedly as she thought. She wasn't even aware of what she had been drawing until Ren glanced over. Oh, who's that? Ren asked, pointing. Sorella glanced down at her paper and froze. She swiftly crunched up the sketch before C3 or Mint could take a good look at it. It's nobody, she hissed. C3 snorted. Looked like you, but with short hair. I don't think that's a very good look for you. Ren shot a glare at C3. I think Sorella would be very beautiful with short hair, she snapped. You just have no fashion sense. Sorella forced herself to relax. They think it was just me. C3 scowled at Ren. He seemed to be in a very bad mood, like an experiment he conducted did not go according to his plan. 
He practically stabbed his pencil on his paper, causing the tip to snap. Grumbling in annoyance, he grabbed his artwork, got to his feet, and left the art studio. Good riddance, Sorella said in satisfaction. I wish he wasn't so mean, Mint moaned softly. He'll have to work a lot on himself first, Ren grumbled. Like that will happen, Sorella scoffed. People can change. Ren said, glancing at her in an odd fashion. Sure, Sorella muttered darkly, glaring at the ground. People say they want to change, then never do. And I doubt C3 will ever want to. Ren shrugged. I believe people can change. Look at you. What about me? You used to be really quiet and never wanted to be around people, but now you've opened up with me, and Zin and even Dad. And you're in an art club, spending time with other students, Ren pointed out. Sorella felt like her jaw would break from how taut it was. She glared at Ren for a long moment, then got to her feet and exited the studio as well. She nearly crashed into Zin outside. Hey, is C3 in there? Zin queried. Sorella frowned. C3? He just left a bit ago. Why? Zin shrugged. I don't know, he murmured. I didn't think he'd be there today. He's always at the meetings, isn't he? Yeah, but last week... Zin let his sentence trail off. What happened last week? Zin shrugged again. He was just being a jerk to Mint after the club. I didn't think he'd show his face there again. Well, he's still a jerk, and I hope he doesn't come back. Sorala grumbled. Anyway, you better go in and spend some time with Ren. She's driving me crazy. About what? Sorella sighed. Just go see her, she muttered. Okay. Sorella pushed past him. Her body was tense, a surge of irritation rising through her. She kept her fists clenched at her sides, still clutching the crunched up paper in one hand. She just wanted to be left alone. And free. She thought dismally, I want to be free from everyone else's problems, from myself, from her. She sighed, heading for the garden as she still didn't have a key to the Saihan family tower. She doubted very much that she'd ever be free again. Her memories would always be tormenting her.